And again, there's a table I put there, which is a subscription to universities in Nigeria. This is from JAMP. And you find out that the most subscribed university in Nigeria is University of Illinois, which has about 100 and over 100,000, 108,000 people trying to get in. Followed by Madu Belo, 81,000, the University of Jaws, 51,000, and others like that. But the most prominent of the private universities, which is Covenant University, is less than 3,000. Now, what's the implication? The implication is that the capacity of about 30 private institutions is what you will get in one single existing old public institution. So the question of access is not being breached as fast as we would love. Towards the end of the lecture, I will come to speak on how we can change that. Now, the other issue is that private universities have the question of dealing with long-term investments. And I'm sure Jabu already has this problem where you are putting money, you are putting money, you are putting money. Yes, you are getting returns probably from fees and other charges, donors, and so on, but it's not matching. And that's because there's a simple truth. The university system is not for profit. And we have to learn that. It is not for profit. It is more if you want a legacy. If you want to socially impact the community and the society. That's what it is for. So, like I say... The private universities may not be able to solve the access problem because of low subscription and then the issue of how do you get money back. So university investment is a long-term thing. And that is why you hear of universities that have been there for a hundred and something years. And I'll tell you, when I visited Cambridge University on a tour of Europe, and I looked at the buildings, and they were telling us this laboratory <laughs> existed in 18-something. And all they did was just refurbish, put new electrical fittings. The building remains the same. So you find out that the real money is more in goodwill and social standing than in what we'll call breakneck uh, profits. Now, the other option is to take the existing universities and put more money there. Like we've shown, if you put a little more money, you can get a higher return because of productivity if you challenge people. And in doing that, you will find out that you can, in fact, limit your exposure because these universities will now need less fixed costs and all you deal with is the variable cost, which will be smaller. And so you can take in more people without extending the cost uh, too far out. Now, the way the federal government has tried to do this, that's government side of things, is to set up the TED Fund, which has been funding public universities. Unfortunately, uh, the private universities have not been able to benefit from this although I believe that that situation uh, has to change somehow, and I hope you can put forward strong arguments for that. Because my argument for that is this. Ted Fund is from tax paid by everybody. I mean, paid by companies. And so if we are in the same community, why should we not, you know, be a part of it? But government can tell you it's my money, but I'm sure you can put up uh, cogent arguments to get that. Now, another way to bring in money to higher educational institutions is through grant making. And this is where there's a challenge. And I'm happy that when I came on campus today, 
one of the first few officials I met was the, I think, RMO or something. The, yeah. So there's a challenge. But the challenge of grant making is this. There are billions of dollars all over the world waiting to be collected. But the truth is, to collect the money or to win the grant, you must align with the objectives, the mission and vision of such organizations. And that is a challenge to us. But beyond that, one of the things with grant making also is that the hit rate, or what you can call the success rate, is very low. If you submit five proposals, you'll be lucky if you get one positive return. But the truth is, every one you get is a booster for your system because you're able to develop staff, you're able to acquire facilities, and you're able to build the confidence of, um, of staff and uh, members of the community. And so this is something that each university should strengthen. And like I recommend, form a unit, and I'm happy Jabu already has one, but staff that unit very well and let that unit coordinate the totality of the manpower pool that you have on campus, uh, even collaborating across your shores with other universities, because that's what the world wants today, collaboration across campuses, across the sea, across nations. Also, one other way, and one good way, is with alumni and donors. But there's a problem. If you don't treat the students well today, they will not be happy to give back later. I remember one of our staff who used to go to look for uh, jobs for students, placement in industry for industrial training. He used to come back and say that when he got to this company, he met the manager. And the manager was saying, is this lecturer still there? And he said, yeah, he's still there. I said, ah, <laughs> those students will suffer. What is he saying? He was not well treated. Please, when I say well treated, I'm not talking of wicked lecturers or wicked staff. I'm talking of people who don't treat you with courtesy. Everybody deserves to be courteously treated. There are students today they are managers tomorrow, they are presidents tomorrow, and they are world leaders. The future belongs to them, and so we must treat them uh, properly. I mentioned alumni, but I must also mention donors. And in mentioning donors, I want to say just like you treat students properly and alumni, you must treat the donors very well. But one model I want to recommend is this. Don't take the money. If a donor comes, let the donor do the work. You get more from that. And I'll give you two examples. My own faculty was put in the wheel. I'll leave out the name of the uh, Nigerian uh, patriot, but he put us in his will. That is, they should construct a new building for us. By the time the will was read and it was time to do, you know, start, the money was not enough to do the building. And federal government at that time said, no more capital projects. So that money was frozen. This is from a donor, not government, outsider. That money was frozen for a long time. Much later, we were able to get it done, but at a far higher cost. Learning from that, another case like that came, not from somebody in the wheel, but from somebody leaving, very one of the richest men in Africa, one of them. And the model was, no, don't give us the money, just do 
the building. So no matter what it costs, the donor handles it. Now, we have not taken this very seriously, but let me share one example. When my university was going to start a business school, a couple of us went on a study tour. And one of the universities we went to, again, I just leave out the name, when we met the dean of a business school, and we're asking, how much money do you really have to play around with? He said they had $400 million sitting pretty. That is, we don't have to touch it. It's just there. And the question was, how did you raise this money? He did not answer us. He took us into a room. He was going to meet the alumni and donors the following weekend. And in that room, what did they have? T-shirt, cap, a regalia for donors. Gold standard, platinum standard, silver standard, bronze standard, depending on what you gave. And in particular, one of the donors were coming that weekend to give $10 million. So depending on how you treat them, there's a lot to learn about donor and alumni management. Now, one other way is consultancy. And in consultancy, you find out that the universities, we always talk about town and gown. But we have been too insular in operations. We keep to ourselves. It is time to launch out, and I hope Jabu can do this quite uh, extensively, to both private and government, let us go and bid. Let us go and bid for these projects, and with time, we will begin to win some of them. My recommendation is that if the government wants the country to develop, some of those contracts and consultancies should actually be damped, that is reserved for local personnel or local institutions, just like we have local content uh, today. And that is the way you can build capacity, the way you can build capability, the way you can build competence, and the way you can build the confidence of people who are around us. Now, having said all this, what are the strategic imperatives for us to begin what actions should we take beyond what I've talked around to make sure that we can develop human capital, we can strengthen the institutions, to make sure that we can have idea forms generated rigorously and encourage innovation. Now, and this is where I will plead that you listen a little carefully. There are many myths in Nigeria. And we say many things that are not correct. First, let me tell you two experiences I had. 1987, I went to a conference and spoke. And one of the questions I was asked is, was, how come Nigeria has not been able to develop a car? And my response with, no single company develops cars. The car has over 2,000 parts, even though Elon Musk is reducing that. <laughs> but the cars we know have over 2,000 parts. And so you have economy of scale and expertise. Somebody is doing the brake lining. Somebody is doing the accelerator cable. Somebody is doing the fender, the body. So you have different people. And what you really have, when we say we have car makers, are people who assemble. And that that will be the way for us to go. When I got to the airport, this was Port Harcourt. I got to the airport and I bought the Sunday paper. And I read the front page. What I saw was, Don says Nigerian car is an impossible dream. And I ask you, was that what I said? 
That wasn't what I said. The second occasion was during the Buhari Diagbon regime. Again, I went somewhere to speak like this. And unknown to me, I did not know pressmen were there. And I don't know if pressmen are here. Uh, so that they capture what we are saying correctly. And again, a question was posed, and I said, look, Nigerians cannot be considered good planners for one reason. The data on which we plan lacks integrity. And if the data lacks integrity, you are going to have problems down the line. Again, I think about three days later, one of the local newspapers uh, put in the paper that Nigerian project will derail. You know, it wasn't a civilian regime. It was a military regime. So when I was having my lunch uh, in the staff, uh, staff club, some of my friends came to meet me and say, oh, you are still in Nigeria. They thought I would have gone towards the borders. But in both instances, what was reported was not what I said. So I want to tackle five myths that we say, but which are not completely true. The first one is free education. And the truth is that there's nothing like free education. You can call it free education. Is free to somebody, but somebody is paying. I hope we get it. It's free to you, but somebody is paying. And that person could be government, could be a sponsor, could be a well-wisher, could be a guardian. Now the second myth is, why don't you just let everybody pay fees and, you know, candidates can afford it. After all, they buy jam and so on. And my answer to that is, some can pay, but many cannot. The third one, which is very popular, everybody's, most people say this, don't tell me that government has enough money to do all this. And the truth of the matter is, that's not correct, because there are several contending sectors of the economy. Education can have the pride of place, but it cannot be the only one. The fourth one is, why don't you solve the problem with scholarships and loans? Because people will pay back. But in reality, whether it's a scholarship or the loan, some will pay back, some will not be able to pay, and some will pay back but not directly. That is, they bring social benefits to the community, but it's not Naira and Kobo. And the fifth one, which I tackled earlier, is that the private higher educational institutions such as Jabu can break even in a short and medium term, and I say that will not be correct. You can only do well on the long term. And so your heavy investments of today will bring many benefits much later on, and you should consider what you are doing as legacy projects. Now, what, having said this, what should those institutions begin to do? Number one, put more money on resourcing facilities and equipment. Because technology has evolved to the point where you can actually share resources. And what I'm saying here is this. You don't have to own an equipment to use it. For example, I think uh, as far back as 15 or 20 years ago, some students in universities in Nigeria were carrying out experiments on equipment in the United States with the universities uh, with which they had agreements. And what was happening? Over the internet, while they are sleeping there, you are awake here, 
you are using the equipment there, iLab. So, if you look at YouTube and so on that have come around us today, you'll find out that you can use resources at the far cheaper rate with reinforced learning than we used to do. So the question of acquisition should be played down and we should find a way to do that. Also pedagogy, which is that learners can use the same tools in what interests them. We're learning now that if you want to engage students to learn, you must make sure that instructions can also be seen where? On the phone. Because that's what interests them. So not just the classroom, the computer, the phone, and so on. And these things come cheaper. I, for example, reco I mean, I register for some courses for as low as $9 over the internet. I take them and so on. So you find out that what you will have paid $1,000 for, you can begin to pay a paltry amount of problem. Now, expanding access to make it more pervasive, and that is where we talk about massification, that it lets the masses participate. Let's have more ODEL, open distance education. Let people learn from where they are. You don't have to be co-located to learn. And that is something everybody is learning today. And I must warn you, as I warn all other universities, mine included, there is a paradigm shift for education, especially higher education. People are beginning to ask the question, why should I go to university for five years or four years to learn a course, to get a degree, when all I need to take are 40 courses? Why don't I stay at home, take these courses online, take the exams and pass and have the skills like anybody else. And what that is saying is that the universities are moving away from bricks and mortar to virtual, what I would call, in the cloud. That is a threat to every bricks and mortar university that is not investing in this new pedagogical change. Grant making, I think I've talked about that. Alumni relations, I've talked about that. Fee structure, which I would like to mention, is that the private universities, especially who have tuition, is a double-edged sword. If you increase the fees, probably get more money on the short run. On the long run, you get less money because the customers, the subscribers, will begin to move back and then you lose the market. So you need to keep a balance. And my recommendation is use a zero budgeting process where it's activity based. You're paying for what you do or what you use. Now, what is the message with I've left private? What's the message for government? The message is that we should begin to take a more systems view of things. We should stop localizing uh, issues. Oh, they spent one million on this student, but see what we are getting from it. That's not the issue. Like we said before, there are social benefits as well as individual benefits. And when a student graduates and begins to train 20 engineers, or 20 other people superintended in the office, that is part of the benefit to society, which we should count. So we should be looking not just at cost, but we should be looking at the sporadic benefits that come with it. Also, the research fund, which is paltry, which I'll say, the TED fund, the research fund, I think for this 2023 is 4.9 4. Uh, 4. billion, let's call it 5 billion. That is... Uh, 30% of the budget of one single university. So when you have that as your research fund to drive the economy, you find out that that it needs to be raised. But I'm not just advocating that money be pumped in. 
pumping money with responsibility, with focus. Why are we giving money for people to find a uh, uh, cure for malaria? Why don't we specify that we found a, well, a plant that could be useful and concentrate the money on that to cure malaria instead of spending money on 50 uh, different things? That brings focus and that needs some discipline to get things done. And of course, employment, government will stop, will have to stop looking at itself as a provider of, the major provider of employment. In fact, if you look at all the people employed by government, they are so small compared to the workers in the country. So what government should be doing more is facilitation. Make sure that private, you know, different people can create uh, jobs. And let me say this and which is unknown to many people. The economy of Nigeria is held by small businesses. The little person in one room, in two rooms, in three uh, bedroom apartment. Because 48% of the GDP that we're talking about today of Nigeria is from those people when you put it together. And so we must begin to deal with them and encourage them. I know there's a loan scheme and all that for them, but we need to do a lot more. Now, education is a driver, just like we've established, and for any country to compete, you must put money there. And there's a picture I always like to show, although I don't have it here, but if you go to the internet, just Google G8. And you probably will see eight to nine people standing. And if you look at all of them, those are the nations that have invested in what? Education, research and development, and what? Technology. And watch one thing. Anytime they want to take the picture, nobody organizes them. That is, nobody says, oh, President of America, stay here. Uh, Germany, come and stay here. They self-organize. Now, but what happens when G20 meets? When G20 meets, again, they organize themselves. But what do they do? They invite our leaders, isn't it? And nobody tells our leaders not to stay in front. Does anybody tell them? Where do you move to? You move to the back because it is intrinsic. There's no, there's no argument. If you don't spend on education, you don't spend on technology, you don't put money to research and development, your place will be at the back. What is my message for the graduates? I urge you to be optimistic, and I tell you Nigeria will be great. In fact, Nigeria is great. It's not a question of will be great. Can you imagine that Ordinary music, the Americans are now copying us, isn't it? They are now asking Nigerian artists that, look, I want, to, I want to do, you know, I want to do a record with you. We've been to the World Cup with our football team before, but do you know who we've been with recently? We didn't qualify, but who did we send? Artists, isn't it? Again, you look at Nollywood. One of the biggest embarrassments I get when I go to a conference outside the country is when people ask me, do you know this uh, artist? And I say, no. They say, ah, you don't watch Nollywood. And uh, they're Nigerian actors. They're earning hard currency. As a matter of fact, Nollywood is one of the biggest in the world today. And what happened? What happened to Nollywood is what we are saying should happen to education. There was a year in which federal government gave 200 billion, okay, to just, oh sorry, 2 billion to, you know, energize them. And today you can see the quality that has come. So if we can do that with music and acting, let's do it with science and tech.
So Nigeria is a great country, I assure you. And no nation in the world has the combination of resources that Nigeria is blessed with. When you talk of manpower, you talk of minerals, you talk of materials. If you go anywhere in the world today, you see Nigerians performing wonders. And one of the feats that still outstands, I mean, is outstanding, is that the first doctor, medical doctor, to bring out a fetus from the mother's womb, operate on it, return it into the mother's womb, and give birth is a Nigerian. And there are many more like that. Many, many more like that. And uh, you'll find out that those who are making waves are people who schooled in this country. So as much as we say that educational standards are falling and so on like that, we are able to cope when we get out there. And I want to encourage you, the graduates, Never mind if it's a two one or a first class. When you get out there, go and show them. And that is why you see Nigerians will go for a master's program with a two one or two two and come out with a distinction. Because in the short time they are there, they are able to cope because all the hardships that they suffer in the country is removed so they can concentrate. Meaning that the talent is latent all we have to do is to resource it. So my advice to you is try to put your best foot forward always. You have been properly trained, and so it's a responsibility to discharge this to make sure that your alma mater can be proud of you. And again, I want to say use every opportunity by leveraging on the knowledge you've acquired by using wisdom. Please, knowledge is different from wisdom. There are people with too much knowledge, but they are incapable of wisdom, and they will continue to fail. Also, be forward-looking, be proactive. When you go for your NYSC, make sure you're already planning one, two years ahead of what you will do. I can assure you that the best is yet to come. So put in your best efforts. To the University Administration of Management, I must say I give you, I give you kudos. I was here about 15 years ago when the school started and I was part of a training for the staff who were recruited at that time. It's a thing of I'm very proud of what I've seen. I've gone around a bit and I can see that you've expanded north, south, uh, in all directions and so I wish you all the best and will continue to pray for you. And in ending it's a little prayer that may your efforts gain traction to meet your goals and objectives. Thank you very much. Let's keep clapping, let's keep clapping. Thank you. You can have your seats. Thank you. Um, that was electrifying and very impactful. While the citation of the guest speaker was on, the pro chancellor of this university came in. I like to recognize and uh, formally welcome the pro chancellor, Professor of professors, AMA Immobile. You're welcome, sir. 
clap. Put your hands together, please. Praise the Lord. As is in practice, the practice we have established here, please stand on your feet. The guest lecturer will sit down. Guest lecturer, sit down. And then we'll give me a round of applause. Let's clap for the lecturer. <laughs> clap on, clap on, clap on, clap on. Thank you very much. Please sit down. We've had an excellent lecture, and there's a lot of food for thought. Page 18 of his paper gives us the imperative strategy for developing human and edu higher education in Nigeria. As is our practice, I request the management to study this document carefully and bring to the governing council Suggestions for improving our higher education ratio. Please do that. Specifically, references to alumni association, references to how you manage donors' contributions. If we have not been doing the right thing, let's make sure that we make correct ourselves. I was listening very carefully to the, speech, to the guest lecturer, and he has a lot of interesting ideas to pass on to us. If it means bringing him back to interact with us, please do so. Eshe Gomni, God bless you. When we started this university, we decided deliberately to have convocation lectures and distinguished lecture series to improve our own learning process by bringing people from universities like University of Ibadan, which was established many centuries ago, and it's a university that is concerned more with higher education learning than with uh, undergraduate programs today. The vice chancellor, the current vice chancellor, had his training in IFE, had his development and maturity in University of Ibadan. So we, t we grabbed him from there, and we hope that he will help us to bring ideas from the developed universities to a developing university like our own. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you, and to assure you that the le guest lecturer has done a good job, and God bless him indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, this time, please, we would like to just take um, a reaction from the lecture given to us. Just one I've been permitted to take. Just a reaction. Two. Two. Can I identify the two? Number one, sir. And uh, who else? Oh, I can see the second hand on there, up there. Thank you. Start from the, the front. Please, you give the reaction, and um, the guest lecturer will respond to it much after the reaction. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, I stand on existing protocols. I want to commend the guest lecturer. Uh, oh, I am Adenle Adeloye, the newly installed AKG of Ikeji. Um, I've listened to this lecture with very rapt attention. And because my 
take off was economics. He was running through as if he did economics. I'm giving figures, facts, statistics relating to development. I say, well done, sir. It's quite commendable. <laughs> the point I want to make is that universities came from the days of Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, and all this stuff. They are still there to today. And they have been funded. Now, I believe that we could still learn one or two things from those universities. What they have done to be able to go on and go on till today and still going on. Um, in 1972, if I was, a, I was a graduating student that year, if I launched a 10-year program with Professor Luasami, and a lot of emphasis was put on the alumni thing. I remember people like Fajem Miroku and all the stuff, they were invited. And because the universities were few, the donors were there. They, they can be rich. And they were putting in a lot of uh, funds. But with expansion, well, wealth has also expanded. So there's no way that it's not difficult for us to be able to tap on the expansion of wealth as well. Um, being a mission university, that's Jabu, I participated in some gathering whereby people said, eh, they, they, they started the university by now, he should start to give them returns, that they should be having returns from the university. I believe there should be a lot of education to the laity, to the ordinary person, the ordinary CAC uh, people, that the university is not, is not like selling pure water, whereby you get returns very, very quickly. The university is a long, long, long time, and in any case, it's not for profit making, but for ensuring that there is legacy. So I think we will have a duty to educate our people and then encourage people to make donations very, very generously so that the university can go on and the system can be happier for all of us. Once again, I thank the guest lecturer and I say, well done, sir. Thank you, sir. Please, the second person. Let's quickly have your reaction before. Standing on the existing protocols, my name is Dr. Joseph Dadasa. I refer to page 15 of your booklet, sir, which is talking about the, the most subscribed universities in Nigeria. And I look at it from the University of Illinois, who happen to be having uh, 108, 917 subscriptions of students during the period. And we have the private, which is the covering university, have 2,892. Sir, the area I'm going, when we look at the population of Nigeria at 206 million, we we'll discover that people who are coming to the universities are very few compared to people who are outside there who are just down through the, do not have access to education. And going by the, a kind of a, a resource that you have uh, propounded in this booklet as a way out, is there any way out from the public-private initiative in order to develop a, a, a synergy to develop our higher education in Nigeria so that everybody will be accessible to education? Thank you and God bless you, sir. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Kabiesi. I pray your reign will be prosperous and peaceful by God's grace. Uh, I think more of what you said as a comment, well, as comments, which even the university has noted. But I support you uh, very well in that uh, most of these universities that you mentioned, like Oxford, uh, Cambridge, they not only get donors, and the donors don't just get their names on maybe buildings and so on. They also get something in return. And one of the things I would like to recommend to maybe the universities, when a donor gives something, it's usual that the donor has either a company or some enterprise. Let the university offer to do something for that enterprise, which would be like consultancy or whatever, but at a lower cost. And that is done in some places where they will tell you, uh, can you give us five problems to solve, you know, and the university solves that. And I can tell you that happened to me when I went for my postgraduate in the UK, I had a problem picking a project. The project allocated to me was to design a hay-making machine. And I refused because I said there's no, there's no hay in Nigeria. So it won't benefit me as such. But in the end, an Iraqi guy decided to go home to fight. I mean, the war at that time. And so the project he was doing, which was formulated by a farmer, sponsored by a farmer, who was saying, can we strip grains using a belt mechanism? And that's what I had to do. So there's this industry that is the farmer is donating something, but is also getting something. So we can do that even with Dangote, whoever comes in uh, to give money here. Now to the question on access. Yes, we can expand access like I've just expounded in the uh, lecture, but let me make one statement which may appear is not, I don't want to call it negative, but it's true. Not everybody can go to university. That's the truth. And in fact, not everybody needs to go to university to do well. Now, those you can catch, catch them. The problem we have now is that one point something million will write the exam. You will bring in only 120, you know, thousand. The subscription figures you see are not the admitted students. Those are the applicants. So the real admission is about 10, 12%. So what happens to the 80, uh, is it 82, 88%? Nigeria is not thinking too much about that because the technical colleges are gone and all the other things. But what you will find is that our neighbors, Bene, Togo, still have these colleges. And that is why if you go to Abuja today, or even Lagos, the people setting the tiles, doing some of the very good work, you know, are people from those places because we have destroyed that side of our educational uh, complement. And so that's what we will need to do. Higher education, universities are probably paramount because of research, element, and so on. But there are other post-secondary, what you can call higher education, that should also be encouraged. And that's the way we can get out of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It's time now to call on the vice chancellor um, for a presentation of gifts on to the guest lecturer. I invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Aladi Fakulujo, to be supported by the Chairman's Ceremonies Committee, Professor Betimei.
Well, once again, we are very appreciative of the lecture. I know when I talk of input and output, a lot has gone into the lecture before you can bring out this output. God will continue to enrich you in knowledge and in everything and safe journey back home after the whole exercise. Thank you very much. And I invite the registrar, Mr. Dekpo Adini. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You will agree with me that whatever has a beginning has an ending. And so we are gradually moving to the end of this program to commemorate our 13th convocation in Jabu with a grand finale tomorrow. Kindly indulge me five minutes of your time as I give the vote of thanks. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is simply likened to wrapping a present to be given to someone and not eventually presenting it. So thanks are in order. And for everyone that has made this program a huge success, from the depth of my heart, on behalf of the chairman of this occasion, Professor A.M.A. Imebore, and the vice chancellor, Professor Fako Lujo, I say a very big thank you to you. At this point in time, this is the exact lecture that we need, that we require, as we grapple with challenges of moving higher education forward in Nigeria. And so the lecture has been so fascinating and intriguing. I'd like to appreciate you so very much for finding time to come and attend this ceremony. Let me quickly run through uh, the list of our guests that are here. We have amongst us some council members and then some board of trustees members. Elder Joshua Orimadegun Abwade, we appreciate you, sir. Thank you so very much for coming. Ms. O.L. Popuala, representing Oshu State Minister of Education, we appreciate you, ma. Professor A.K. Omidei, mommy, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you. Barista Biosolua Adenuga, we appreciate you, ma. Thank you for coming. We have one member of the Board of Trustees here, Daddy Nyoda, Mr. Babatuji Nyoda, we appreciate you, sir. Thank you for coming. Then also we have visiting vice chancellors here represented. We have the representative of the vice chancellor, Lagos State University, with us here, Dr. Karim Ibrahim. Where is he? Oh, thank you for coming, sir. We appreciate you. The representative of the vice chancellor, Leeds City University. Thank you for coming. Dr. Olaleye Tunde, we appreciate you, sir. The representative of the Vice Chancellor, Federal University of Technology, Akure, Professor O.A. Belo Olusoji, thank you for coming, sir. And the representative of the Vice Chancellor, Elizade University, Dr. Joseph Aremo, he used to be Igbadun Ojokon. Thank you very much, sir. 
We also have here the wife, David of Ikeji, Arakeji, Mama Queen Emo, Adeloye. Mommy, thank you for your support. We really appreciate you. You are the backbone that the KBAC rest, rests upon. Thank you very much, Ma. We also have Prince Olu Adeloye from the Royal House. Thank you very much, Daddy. We appreciate you. And we also have Amizos, the personal assistant to the KBAC, Mr. Olu Watayo, Olu Sojo. Thank you for coming. The Christ Apostolic Church, Nigeria and uh, overseas is also represented here. And so we have Amistos, a district superintendent representing Unity DCC, Adoekiti, Pastor Professor Stephen Afolabi. Thank you very much, sir. He was the immediate past provost of the CAC Theological Seminary, Ileife. Daddy, thank you very much. You have been a friend of the university. The Lord will continue to be with you in the name of Jesus. We also have evangelist Adeniji Adekunle from the DCC, CAC Adoekiti. Thank you for coming. The fourth estate of the realm is also represented here, and we have amidst us Mr. Emmanuel Adeninro. Thank you very much. And we also have the publisher of Evans Publishers, Mr. Fakolade Oladi Pupo. We really appreciate your presence. Your presence actually made this ceremony a huge success. And now may I make this comment. If you do not have the interest of our university at heart, you will not attend this ceremony, especially in a time like this. The first scarcity is eating so hard so hard on our economy and, you know, on our pulse, so to say. So for the love that you have towards us, we really appreciate you so very much. Thank you for coming. Let me now come home. Oh, please, for those guests that I have not been able to mention their names, it isn't intentional. We recognize you, and God recognizes you. Thank you so very much for coming. To our students, our very lovely students, great job, White. Your presence, and we appreciate your support all the way. The Alumni Association represented here, we appreciate you. Thank you for everything. Our parents that are here at this particular centers, Dr. S. Babalola, of the GNS Directorate. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you. Dr. Dio Alabi of the Academic Planning Unit. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for coming. Baba Deleke, our Abuja Liaison Officer. Thank you for coming all the way from Abuja. And therefore, all the, to all the directors, the directors in the, uh, in the registry, Mr. Femi Fashui, Director Personnel, thank you for everything. Uh, Pastor J.O. Babalola, uh, of the academic plan, uh, academic uh, affairs. Thank you for being there for us. And then I come to this side of the hall, and I want to recognize all our deans. The dean of the College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences, Dr. Chayo Oyedele. Thank you very much, ma'am. The dean of the College of Environmental Sciences, Professor Olushe Gurie, Daddy, thank you for everything. And the Dean of the College of Earth Sciences, Professor O. O. Okai, thank you, sir, for everything. I wonder why you are seated there. I wonder why you are seated there. You, are, you ought to have been here but for whatever reasons. Thank you for coming, sir. Then, Professor, uh, the Dean of the College of Law, Professor O. J. Jejelola, thank you very much, sir. The Dean of the College of Management Sciences, Professor Festus Mubolaji Akwetiwei. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you. He doubles also as the chairman of the ceremonies committee. And my thanks go to you too, sir, and the rest of your committee. Because if you have not actually put lots of 
things together, we will not be here this afternoon. Thank you for all you do, sir. We appreciate you. And then, I also appreciate the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, <laughs> Professor Tokumbu Adaja. Thank you very much, sir. And then, the Dean of the College of Postgraduate Studies, our own Professor Kain Dei Misi Agbara Oloru Temitokpe Eniola. Thank you very much, sir, for being there. Incidentally, he is the immediate past acting vice chancellor of the university. We appreciate you, sir. Thank you so very much. Dr. J. J. Obaga Biola, the anchor man, thank you very much, sir. Mrs. Dr. Mrs. Otemu Yiwa, the, our orator, thank you very much, ma. Our deputy university librarian, Dr. Joseph Adeniyi Kolawole, thank you very much, sir. The acting bossa of the university, Mr. Olalekon Ariyibi, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you. And then, I want to recognize our own lecturer, the guest lecturer, Daddy Ayodeji, Professor Ayodeji, Emmanuel Oluleye. The lecture was thought-provoking, sir. It was thought-provoking and like, just like the, uh, the pro chancellor rightly said, it is resourceful. And so we are going to really develop that lecture, sir. We appreciate you very much. For, for, first of all, for accepting to come and deliver this lecture. Then for finding out time out of your busy schedule. Daddy, we really love you. Thank you very much. You have watered our lives. The Lord will water your life in the name of Jesus. I come to Babai Mebore, our own Babai Mebore, Professor Anthony Malomo Imebore, <laughs> the Pro Chancellor and Chairman of the Governing Council. Daddy, in spite of your age, Daddy was 87 in November 2022. In spite of your age, you still find time, sir, to attend to issues that concern us. The Lord will continue to attend to your issues, sir, in the name of Jesus. Whenever we call upon you, you always oblige us. We appreciate you very much, sir. Daddy, Abanya Daleo, Okonya de Bale, Iyaudeni, Jeyilo Juaye, in the name of Jesus. Thank you very much, sir. And then, I come to the big masquerade. My own vice chancellor, <laughs> Professor Olashebiko Alade Fakolujo. This is a vice chancellor with a difference. Yes. I, I, I make bold to say that. Since he came to this university in October 2022, it has always been from one level of development to another level of growth. We give it to you, sir. Thank you very much. It has been miracles every day. And we can see it. It is evident. Things are changing. There is a paradigm shift. Sir, we love you. We appreciate you. You will finish well in the name of Jesus. And you will finish strong in the name of Jesus. Above all, we appreciate our God, the Almighty, that made this occasion possible for us. Without him, we are nothing. All glory and honor and adoration belongs to him. Thank you very much for coming. Eshebuko. Thank you. I now invite to the podium for closing prayer the university chaplain, Pastor Johnson Olushola Oluwasami. Shall we rise to pray? Heavenly Father, we return our glory to you. We thank you for the starting of this program. Thank you for the way you have taken control. We bless you for our resource person. Thank you for the blessings that we have received. Father, we say your name is exalted in Jesus' name. And Lord, we are asking for the grace 
the ability of God that this information we have been given as individuals and as institution will be able to process it and, be, and bring out positive results in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we are praying that as we come together tomorrow for the convocation, you will take control in Jesus' name. As many people have been coming for this program, Father, we decree journey masses in Jesus' name. Thank you because the rest of that is for the day you will take control. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Okay, as we set to take the university anthem, please, immediately after the recession is on, all other doors that enter the place, please, let it be locked. Make use of other places. So please, we use the foyer for reception for our guests. Jabu anthem, followed by national anthem. Jabu, citadel of knowledge, wisdom, spiritual prowess, endowed with faith and grace. The centers we are sent to lead them to conquer. Onward, so in like eagles fly. Oh, hell, a Jabu, a place of glory. Oh, fuck a damn in giant, a spiritual grandeur. Faithfulness to a nation and holiness will be with Jabu, my pledge I give to thee. All hail a Jabu, God our strength we are, worldliness, integrity, and industry are gone. Like to a nation, yes, Jabu, shine, oh, shine, oh. Destined for success and victory. Alela Jabu, a place of glory. Oh, fuck a damn big giant, a spiritual grandeur. Faithfulness to a nation, and holiness to me. With Jabu, my pledge, I give to thee. session takes place now to the foyer please let the foyer be vacant as the recession move towards there let's remain standing and as the recession move out thank you